All right, everybody, welcome to OT with DA. We just spent about 15 minutes talking about, um, what did we talk about? Skiing and bird watching and my son. Uh, let's see, what does Jennifer say here? Let me read this. The best thing and rock climbing is the best thing and fishing is the best thing and biking is the best thing and running is the best thing and playing guitar is the best thing and preaching. I sense, Jennifer, that you are making fun of me. She says, David has many interests. That's true. But, but I would say my favorite interests in terms of recreational interests would have to be bird watching and rock climbing and backpacking. Like if I had to give up all the other things that I enjoy doing as far as recreational interests, I would keep climbing, birding, and backpacking. Obviously guitar, I'm not including guitar in that because guitar is something you do in your house. It's something you do for fun, for worship. And then if I could add one more, I would add fly fishing. I'm including hiking with backpacking. Okay, those are those are my those are my so that's the hierarchy of David's recreational interests. Welcome everybody. Hope you had a good day. I had a full day, a giant day. I'm not going to tell you all about it because I told Violetta tonight that I would be one hour, and I've told her this one time before, and I managed to do it. I was away from her. We were apart today all day. So as soon as I walk in the door, I came right in my study, and I was just had my nose in a book for the last like two and a half hours. So she hasn't seen me and she likes, you know, she likes me. Yeah, what can I say? And I like her. So I said, babe, tonight I'll only be an hour, just one hour. And especially since I'm starting at 7.30 rather than seven, I, I wasn't ready for seven, apologies for that. So we're gonna get into this chapter 36, the last king of Judah. All right, you guys ready? The last king of Judah. We are in a single chapter tonight. Just a reminder, tomorrow night we have a double chapter. That is chapters 37 and 38, okay? So tomorrow will not be an hour, okay? Tomorrow will not be an hour. We've already done all the greetings and the chatting and the catching up, the answering of questions. So I'm gonna start with prayer and we're gonna get into chapter 36. Welcome everybody, so glad you're here. Father in heaven, thank you for your love and mercy. Uh, please bless us now as we open this chapter up. Father, it's an important chapter. It's a chapter that we can learn a lot from. And Father, as with all of the chapters, of course, there are things that we can learn, but there, there are certain chapters, Lord, at least for me, at this time in my life, it just feels like, yes, that's, that's something I really, there's a lot I can take on board there. And I want to pray for everybody that's tuned in, Lord, different people, different circumstances, different situations. Some people are up, some people are down. Father, some people are struggling, some people are prospering. Lord, we just place our lives right now into your hands. You are capable, you are good, you are kind, you are merciful. And so, Father, we just cast ourselves again onto you, and we're just praying that you would watch over us and give us the confidence that you are watching over us. Uh, we love you and thank you. We place our lives into your capable hands and into the crucified hands of Jesus, your Son, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys ready? Chapter 36, and um, as per usual, I am, uh, I'm really excited about my word tonight. This is another one of those, I, I don't think it's quite on the same level as against in the chapter of Jeremiah. I think that's maybe been my best word so far, at least for me, the one that really captured. But I, I like my word, but I suspect that others will um, have this same word. I actually had one word, I was like, oh yeah, that's my word. And I was quite settled on it, and I'll share that with you in a little bit. But then I was another one. I was like, no, this is actually a better word. I like it. It captures the chapter more for me. All right, so here we are. We're in the closing scenes, the final sad, tragic scenes of Judah's fall, its demise, right? Israel is already been scattered into the you know realm of Assyria, and uh, it's less a captivity and more of a scattering where the situation in Judah is going to be more of a captivity. Um, certainly a lot of death with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, which we'll get to. Um, but this has all been prophesied by various prophets, including uh, the one that's really been um, under the microscope for us in the last few chapters, Jeremiah. And today we get a lot of Jeremiah, a little bit of Ezekiel, probably won't spend too much time talking about Ezekiel, just make a few mentions of him. But here we are, the last king of Judah, Jeremiah continues to to pour his heart out to the king and to his advisors to try and help them to see the, the reality of the situation in which they are living because they are deluded. 
And they're not only deluded by the false prophets that are proliferating, but they're deluded by their own hearts, their carnal hearts. They're trying to persuade themselves of something that is not the case, that is not true, and that is not going to happen. And Jeremiah is there as the almost the lone truth teller, helping the people to see, and especially the leadership to see in Judah and even the surrounding nations, hey, this is what's going to happen. This is the situation and the circumstance in which we find ourselves. Don't be deceived or deluded. And, you know, unsurprisingly, nobody wants to hear what Jeremiah has to say because what Jeremiah has to say is not flattering. It's not good news. It's not encouraging. Um, and so they're largely dismissive of Jeremiah. And that's the chapter that we're in today. So let's start reading. Um, paragraph one, page 422 of the types and symbols version, looks like 440 of the original. Zedekiah at the beginning of his reign was trusted fully by the king of Babylon and had as a tried counselor, the prophet Jeremiah. Off to a good start. By pursuing an honorable course toward the Babylonians and by paying heed to the messages from the Lord through Jeremiah, he could have kept the respect of many in high authority and have had opportunity to communicate to them a knowledge of the true God. Mm. She's always on that evangelistic angle, that the goal is always to communicate the truth about the one true God. She's always on that angle because again, that is as she said, and as the Bible makes clear, the very purpose for which Israel was raised up. Continuing on here, thus the captive exiles already in Babylon would have been placed on vantage ground and granted many liberties. The name of God would have been honored far and wide and those that remain in the land of Judah would have been spared the terrible calamities that finally came upon them. So here again, and I've mentioned this many times before, we have this feature of Ellen White's writing where she writes in this counterfactual motif, right? What could have been, what might have been, what should have been. And in this paragraph alone, you know, she says, could have, could have had, would have, would have, and would have. In other words, what, she, what she's doing, she often does this. She sets up what is happening or what is predicted to happen and what could have happened, what should have happened, what might have happened. And that is really the pivot on which this whole chapter hinges. How will Zedekiah relate to the Babylonian king and to the Babylonian captivity? If he relates, as, as is said here, by pursuing an honorable course, then everything will go as well as can be for Judah. Uh, if he departs from that honorable course, then it's going to get really bad, and that's what the whole chapter is about. Next paragraph. Through Jeremiah, Zedekiah, and all Judah, including those taken to Babylon, were counseled to submit quietly to the temporary rule of their conquerors. It was especially important that those in captivity should, and this is very important, seek the peace of the land into which they had been carried. I'm going to come back to this when we get to the rubric. This, however, was contrary to the inclinations of the human heart, and Satan, taking advantage of the circumstances, caused false prophets to arise among the people, both in Jerusalem and in Babylon, who declared, in fact, oh, the yoke of bondage would soon be broken and the former prestige of the nation would be restored. Okay, a lot, a lot in these first two paragraphs. So the first thing here is that God's counsel to Judah through Jeremiah is to submit quietly, to behave honorably toward Babylon, to pray for the peace of of Babylon and to not yield to the inclinations of the carnal heart, which would be to resist. Because nobody wants to be controlled, nobody wants to be enslaved, nobody wants to be taken captive. And so the natural inclination here would be to resist, right? Resistance. But God, through Jeremiah, is saying, don't resist, submit quietly. And the reason is not because the Babylonians are good people and not because it, you know, there's some virtue or value in submitting to tyrants or to, you know, cruel marauders, but because this is a punishment from God, right? Babylon is, you might remember from last chapter, an instrument in the hands of God. And so in submitting to Babylon, what they're really submitting to is God's punishment or God's chastisement of their generational rebellion. That's the crucial point. In other words, it's not saying here, if you're being abused, if you're taking, being taken advantage of, if you're, you know, in all situations, you know, uh, people that are enslaved or that have been taken captive, you should just submit. That's not what's being said here. In this particular case, God's advice is to submit. Why? Because 
Babylon has been ordained and raised up by Yahweh for the purpose of punishing his rebellious people. And Assyria was raised up to punish Israel. And so to Babylon to punish Judah. So the submission is sort of primarily to Yahweh and secondarily to Babylon. Babylon is the instrument in Yahweh's hand, the instrument of chastisement and of rebuke and of punishment. Now, again, this is a punishment that they have brought on themselves through generational rebellion and through generational idolatry, okay? So let's keep reading here. The heeding of such flattering prophecies, and I thought that was a fascinating juxtaposition of words, flattering prophecies. And I just wrote there, nope, never, no such thing. There's no flattering prophecies because the word flatter, which comes up several times in this chapter, as you would have noticed, it literally means to say something that is untrue or disingenuous or inauthentic to try and procure a, an advantage, a social advantage or a political advantage, to try and procure, to tell somebody something that you don't actually believe. It's inauthentic, it's disingenuous, but you're trying to, you're trying to leverage the, the compliment or the flattery to advantage yourself with whoever this person is. And this happens a lot with kings, right? The language here is a, 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 a sycophant, which just means a yes man. Uh, people that flatter the rulers. And, and so this idea of a flattering prophecy is oxymoronic, right? There, there, there are no flattering prophecies because God is the author of all the prophecies, the true prophecies, and he's not a flatterer. He's a truth teller. And flattery by definition is not telling the truth. Now, there's a difference between flattering someone and just giving someone a compliment. Sometimes I'll give people compliments. I'll say, oh, that looks really nice in you. Or, oh, I really like the way you said that. Or, oh, that's a really great use of that word. And sometimes people will mistakenly say, oh, you're flattering me. No, 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 no. I'm not flattering you because it would only be flattery if I was saying something that I didn't really believe in order to procure some sort of an advantage, a social, you know, to, in, to ingratiate myself to you. No, just a compliment, a sincere, honest, open-hearted, virtuous compliment is a compliment. That's not flattery. Flattery is a different kind of thing. And so the heeding of such flattering prophecies, here it is again, would have led to fatal moves on the part of the king and the exiles and would have frustrated the merciful plans of God on their behalf. Lest an insurrection be incited and great suffering ensue, the Lord commanded Jeremiah to meet the crisis without delay by warning the king of Judah of the sure consequence of rebellion. The captives were also admonished by written communication not to be deluded. That's a very important word. It's not my word for the chapter, but a very important word that you should underline. Not to be deluded into believing that their deliverance was near. Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, he urged in Jeremiah 29. In this connection, mention was made of the Lord's purpose to restore Israel at the close of the 70 years of captivity told by, foretold by his messengers. This is now at least the second time that the 70 years of captivity have come up. And what we're going to see is that a little bit later, one of the false prophets, Hananiah, says, no, 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 no. 70 years? No, it's only going to be two years. Only two years. And now, just think this through. If you were given the option to listen to a prophet that was saying, we're going to go into Babylonian captivity for 70 years, that's a long time. That's longer than the lifespan of most people that are living at this time, by far. Or a prophet that was saying, hey, we're going to go into captivity, but it will only be two years. Which would you want to be true? Well, everybody would much rather be in the adversity of, you know, pagan captivity for two years versus 70. I mean, it's 35 times longer. So everybody's going to opt for the, for the two. And so that's what she means by flattering prophecy, a flattering prophecy, telling people things that aren't true to try and curry favor with them and encourage them in a time when encouragement is not needed, repentance is needed, transformation is needed, humility is needed, contrition is needed. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Continuing to read, with what tender compassion did God inform his captive people of his plans for Israel? I love that, tender compassion. He knew that should they be persuaded by false prophets to look for a speedy deliverance, their position in Babylon would be made very difficult. Any demonstration or insurrection, second time she's used that word, on their part would awaken the vigilance and severity of the Chaldean authorities and would lead to a further restriction of their liberty, second time she's used that word. So, so let, let's just pause here and note that what God is after, that they've gotten themselves into a, a pickle, a difficult situation, and here's what God is saying. Okay, look, I've said for two or three generations now that, well, all the way back to Moses, really, if you want to go back to the blessings and cursings, but we've been getting closer and closer and closer to this captivity, to this exile. 
It is coming. It is absolutely coming. But it can be as good as it can be. And she have, she even later uses the word pleasant. Like she actually uses that word pleasant. It can be as pleasant as it can be if you just quietly submit to the Babylonian rule and see them as an extension of my chastisement of generational rebellion. So, so even here, God is trying to counsel them how to strategically carry themselves in Babylon, right? Behave honorably and pray for the good of the nation and of the city. And above all, try to represent Yahweh, me, try to represent me favorably to the people because I have people here too. I have people in Babylon just like I have people in Nineveh. Okay, so so, so even in, pun- feel this, you guys, even in punishment, God is like advising them how to handle the punishment and how to go into the punishment in such a way so as to make it as 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 less of a pun as little of a punishment as it need be to make it even pleasant okay and if they do this then they will be received favorably by the babylonians they will be perceived well and they will be given more liberty right a longer leash so to speak suffering and disaster would result he desired them to here it is a second time now submit quietly Submit quietly to their fate and make their servitude as pleasant as possible. There it is. To make their servitude as pleasant as possible. Is it pleasant? No, but as pleasant as possible, given the unfortunate and adverse circumstances. And his counsel to them was build houses, dwell in them, plant gardens, eat their fruit. Here it is again. Seek the peace of the city of Babylon, where I have caused you, I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to Yahweh for Babylon, for in its peace, you will have peace. Crucially important verses here from Jeremiah 29. Very important verses. God is, again, advising them how to carry and conduct themselves in Babylon so they can have the best possible outcome for themselves and for the Babylonians. If, however, you are perceived as being rebellious and and insurrectionists, then this is going to, how does she say, awaken the vigilance and severity of the Chaldean authorities, and this would lead to a further restriction of their liberties, and suffering and disaster would result. So God here has given, at some level, Judah favor in the eyes of the Babylonians, so much so that they even allow some of these latter kings in Judah to be vassals. And, And Zedekiah is a vassal king, and he retains that position right up until the point where he actually breaks a vow that he had reiterated, and we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, let's keep reading. Among the false teachers in Babylon were two men who had claimed to be holy, but whose lives were corrupt. Jeremiah had condemned the evil course of these men and had warned them of their danger. Angered by reproof, they sought to oppose the work of the true prophet by stirring up the people to discredit his words and to act contrary to the counsel of God in matters in the matter of subjecting, that's another word for submitting, themselves to the king of Babylon. Uh, The Lord testified through Jeremiah that these false prophets should be delivered into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar and slain before his eyes, and not long afterward, this prediction was literally fulfilled. Next paragraph is a point of practical application about false, flattering prophets and messengers from God, God in quotes. To the end of time, men will arise to create confusion and rebellion among those who claim to be representatives of the true God. Those who prophesy lies will encourage men to look upon sin as a light thing, When the terrible results of their evil deeds are made manifest, they will seek, if possible, to make the one who has faithfully warned them responsible for their difficulties, even as the Jews charged Jeremiah with their evil fortunes. But as surely as the words of Jehovah through his prophet were vindicated anciently, so surely will the certainty of his messengers be established today. Okay, so one of the major takeaways from this chapter has to be that we need to be aware that there is is in the world messages that are true messages. And there are messages that are false messages. Now, Scripture is truth, right? And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And and things that are true and good and honorable and beautiful, these are things that proceed from God and that honor God. Okay? So, yes, the world is filled with truth and beauty. But the world is also filled with falsehood and confusion and flattery. And what we need to learn to do is to tune our ears to truth. Uh, scriptural truth, yes. Relational truth, yes. Uh, the truth of, of nature, the, the truth of how to reason from cause to effect, 
what's sometimes called you know, deductive or inductive reasoning, right? We need to learn how to tune our ears to the truth and to not surround ourselves with people that will just say things to us that will flatter us and encourage us in our sin. That's what she means by uh, the people that uh, treat sin as a light thing. In other words, people that tell you, oh, no, you don't have to worry about repentance. You don't have to worry about punishment. You don't have to worry about judgment. All of that. No, 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 no. That, that's all. No, actually not. Like, you need to read the text of Scripture, and the text of Scripture has a lot to say about sin and wrath and judgment, right? And about deception and, of course, truth and love and beauty and forgiveness and mercy. So we need to learn to tune our ears to the truth. And in tuning our ears to the truth, we will recognize false and flattering messages deceptive messages and delusional messages when we hear them. And if we're, if we're confused and we're not sure, is this right or is this right, then we're going to go to the truth, which is Scripture, and we're going to weigh and measure everything by the truth of Scripture. And not in our own isolated private interpretation, but we're going to surround ourselves with a good, godly community of others who are truth seekers. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to, as a community, move forward with this accountability that we've talked about, and we're going to be the best versions of ourselves, tuning our ears to the truth, tuning our ears to the spirit, right? The spirit of truth who will guide us into all truth. And that's what she's describing here. We live in a time, I mean, over and over again, Jesus in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 is like, hey, be careful that you're not deceived. Beware of false prophets, for many false prophets will arise and deceive many. So we have to learn how to discern what is true. The gospel is true. The law is true. Jesus is true. The text of scripture is true, tuning our ears to true things. Okay, I'm going to keep reading here. From the first, Jeremiah had followed a consistent course in counseling submission to the Babylonians. There it is again. This counsel was given not only to Judah, but to many of the surrounding nations in the earlier portion of Zedekiah's reign. Ambassadors from the, from the rulers of Edom, Moab, Tyre, and other nations visited the king of Judah to learn whether this judgment, the judgment this time was, uh, whether his judgment whether in his judgment, there we go, the time was opp opportune for a united revolt and whether he would join them in battling against the king of Babylon. In other words, Jeremiah is now not only prophesying to Judah, he's prophesying to the surrounding nation saying, hey, don't get some big idea of forming a coalition to try to wage war against Babylon because Babylon's bigger, stronger, more powerful, as was described in Habakkuk. We talked about that. And furthermore, it's not just Babylon, but God is using Babylon as his instrument for punishing this generational rebellion that was taking place in Judah. So don't resist is the short version. Don't resist. Um, so then God tells him to, to make these like bonds, to make fetters and, and bind himself up and to use them as an illustration to say, don't try an insurrection, don't try a rebellion, quietly submit to Babylon and everything will be okay. Uh, next paragraph, I'll read a little bit there. Jeremiah was commanded to instruct the ambassadors to inform their rulers that God had given them all into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, not just Judah, but all these other nations that we mentioned. The ambassadors were further instructed to declare, next paragraph, to their rulers that if they refused to serve the Babylonian king, they would be punished with sword, with the sword, with famine, and the pestilence, till they were consumed, especially were they to turn from the teaching of the false prophets who might counsel otherwise. Do not listen to your prophets, the Lord declared nor to your diviners, your dreamers, your soothsayers, or your sorcerers who speak to you saying, oh no, you're not going to serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you to remove you far from your land, and I will drive you out and you will perish. But the nations that bring their necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will let them remain in their own land as vassals, right? So this is the best of a bad situation. God's literally telling them how to take the punishment that is forthcoming says the Lord, and they shall till it and dwell in it. The, and this is incredible. This is such an incredible line. I hope you all underline this. This is page 425, kind of toward the middle top. Uh, 444, it looks like, of the original. The lightest punishment that a merciful God could inflict upon so rebellious a people was submission to the rule of Babylon. But if they warred against this decree of servitude, they were to feel the full vigor of his chastisement. So I love this. Even in the punishment that God is bringing about, this promised punishment that God is bringing about on Judah, he is saying, this is how you can minimize and lighten the punishments that's, that's coming. This is how you can keep your liberty high. This is how you can remain in your land. 
This is how you can retain the favor of the king of Babylon. You can till your own land. You can remain in your own land. Yes, some have been carried away captive, but not everybody's going to go away captive and there's not going to be mass slaughter. And I'll just throw this in there. The city's going to remain intact. The temple is going to remain in intact. It's going to be okay. And this period will last just 70 years. I know that's a really long time, but it could be worse. And if you don't believe me, just try to resist the king of Babylon and you'll see what worse looks like. And the false prophets are all saying, oh, no, 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 we'll be fine. It's only going to be two years. The, the king of Babylon is not even going to be successful in subjugating us. And, and Jeremiah has been marshaled urgently by God to go let them know, don't go down that path. Don't go down that road. That's not the truth. Again, they need to be tuning their ears to the truth, but instead they're tuning their ears to these delusions, to these falsehoods, to these deceptions, and these flattering prophecies are going to lead them astray and increase the pain and suffering that is going to come to them through the Babylonian captivity. Okay, against the determined, same page, against the determined opposition, Jeremiah stood firmly for the policy of submission, so he did not move, he didn't waver. He was not trying to play favorites with the king or with his uh, counselors. Prominent among those who pres presumed to gainsay the counsel of the Lord was Hananiah, one of the false prophets against whom the people had been warned, thinking to gain the favor of the king and of the royal court. That's literally the, the, literally the definition of flattery. To gain the favor of the king and the royal court, you're going to what? Say things that they want to hear. That's like the definition of flattery. But that's not Jeremiah. Jeremiah is operating on principle. He's not operating on politics. He's not trying to flatter. He's trying to tell the truth. And the truth doesn't sound great. 70 years of captivity doesn't sound great. But it could be the best version of a Babylonian captivity where many of them would, again, still be able to stay in their land. The city's not destroyed. The temple's not destroyed. It could be okay. It says that uh, he lifted up his voice in protest, declaring that God had given him words of encouragement for the Jews. So this is Hananiah. No, 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 no. Not a word, not a word from the Lord of punishment, not a word of chastisement, not a word of rebuke and of adversity, but a work of a word of encouragement. I'm just going to say something about this very briefly. Many years ago, I was involved in a disciplinary situation in my local church. And there was a person who was behaving consistently, I would say serially, over years behaving in a certain way and in a way that was extremely unhelpful to them, unhelpful to the church, unhelpful to the youth in the church. Like the person was just really, we labored and 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 labored, and labored with this person. And finally, it became really obvious to me that this person needed to be um, dealt with from a, from a uh, church discipline perspective. Like, we needed to have a sit-down conversation. We need to begin the process of church discipline. And if if necessary, of what we might call disfellowshipment or dismembership. Like, like you, you're not going to be welcome here anymore because you have just so habitually, so serially, and so rebelliously behaved in these ways. And lots of different people at lots of different times over years have cautioned you and urged you not to behave this way. And so we finally got down to the sort of pointy end of the spear and we were actually in the very meeting, the board meeting, business meeting, where this person's membership was coming up for conversation. And there was almost unanimity in the room. Like the majority of people, I would say, I don't know the number, but we'll say 80 or 80 or higher percent all felt the same way because we all were aware that this is a situation that had been going on for many years. And in the middle of all this, when the church is taking a necessary, but you know, not an easy action, not an action that anybody was happy to take or wanted to take. I mean, we waited way too long. I mean, in my opinion, we waited too long and it actually emboldened the person to continue to behave this way. That's another story. But in the middle of this, when we're just about ready to, you know, take the vote and to move forward, there was a well-meaning but ultimately misguided group of people that, that started saying, oh, no, 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 we need to encourage this person. We need to draw close to this person. We, and that's true. Yeah, that this person had lots of people that had drawn close to them and lots of people that had encouraged them. That had been going on for a long, long time. And yet those more kind and, and tender overtures had been consistently used or manipulated so that the person could continue to act in these ways that was really unhelpful to himself and to the church. So I, I just felt like pulling my hair out because it was like, no, there is a time for punishment. 
Yeah, of course, there's a time for encouragement as well, but this was not a time for encouragement. The time for encouragement had long since passed. The encouragement wasn't going to get this person or the church to where they needed to get. It, it was this kind of a situation where it was like, we're at the zero hour and we need to make us a decision. And he could just feel in the room that people were like, well, maybe, maybe we should. And I was just like, okay, whatever. Fortunately, some, you know, wise heads uh, stood up and, and made the case that we'd been laboring for years. And this was, you know, a consistent situation. And all of what was being advised by this other group had already been done. And then the vote was taken and was overwhelmingly one way. So the point here is this. The, the message of Hananiah is a message of encouragement. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm one of the most encouraging people you'll ever meet. I love encouraging people. I, I just, it, I love to build people up. The old, world here, old word here is to edify. Okay, no problem. I love it. But there is a time when encouragement is not the thing that's needed right now in this specific situation. And that's what happened here, right? It says here, he lifted up his voice in protest, declaring that God had given him words of encouragement for the Jews. No, the only words of encouragement would be, I encourage you to submit quietly and to pray for the peace of Babylon and to submit yourselves to Babylon and see out your 70 years of captivity. That's how I'm encouraging you, but that's not what's meant here by encouragement. Let's keep reading. It says, um, said he, thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years, I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had took away, uh, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. I will bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah who went to Babylon, says the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Well, that is all very encouraging. Oh man, that's such an encouraging message. Oh, it's only going to be two years and all the captives are going to come back and all the holy furniture is going to come back. Everything, and they all lived happily ever after. Yeah, there's only one problem with this encouraging message. It's false. And it's not the time for that message. Was there a time for that message? Sure. 10, 20, 30, 40, 100, 200 years before, but this is not the time for that message. And there are times, even in our age today, where people behave in certain ways so consistently, habitually, and serially that we have to honor their choice and give them over to the consequences of the choices that they themselves are making. And that is not the time for encouragement. Will there come a time down the road for encouragement? Yes. That's the time for telling the truth. And the truth in those situations is very often not encouraging. Saying to somebody, hey, you're going to go into Babylonian captivity for seven years is not an encouraging message. But it's true. And if I have to choose between hearing something that is you know, at some level, psychologically or emotionally encouraging, or if I have to hear something that's true, if those are my options, I'm going to take the true thing, not just the encouraging thing. Because sometimes even encouraging is not the right thing. Not at that time, under those circumstances, in that situation. And so just wanted to bring that as a sort of practical application that there are false, I don't want to say prophets, but there, but there are people that mean well there are people that mean well that will literally say the wrong thing for this time and place and this circumstance and this situation. Okay, so then the next paragraph, Jeremiah, in the presence of the priests and people, earnestly entreated them, and here it is again, to submit to the king of Babylon for the time the Lord had specified, which is 70 years. Okay, so then um, Jeremiah basically says, now I'm on page 426, 427, I'm going to pick it up here a little bit. He basically says, hey, look, there's a way to find out here if I'm right or Hananiah's right. How about this? You listen to what I say, and it's going to go well for you. And if you listen to what Hananiah says, it's not going to go well for you. And she says, if Israel chose to run the risk, future developments would effectually decide which was the true prophet, Jeremiah or Hananiah. Next paragraph, the words of Jeremiah counseling submission aroused Hananiah to a daring challenge of the reliability of the message delivered. So she uses the word here, daring and risk. So this is a risky bet here. We're going to either wager that Jeremiah or Hananiah is telling the truth. And what Jeremiah is saying is, I wouldn't take that wager. That's a, that's a high stakes, high risk wager. And yet that's exactly what they elected to do. And the, the Hananiah, the false prophet comes over. He takes this yoke that Jeremiah had fashioned off of his neck. He breaks it and says, even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all the nations within a space of two full years. 
And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. That's how the next paragraph begins. Apparently, he could do nothing more than to retire from the scene of conflict. And I thought, this is the honorable thing to do in this situation, right? Like, there's nothing more that can be done here. The, the king wants to hear lies. The counselors want to hear lies. They want to hear false messages, delusional messages of encouragement. And so they're not going to hear Jeremiah's 70 years versus Hananiah's two years. And so when he realizes that the crowd, as it were, that the he read the room and he said, nobody's with me, they're all with him, and he left. But then as he was leaving, he got a message from the Lord who told him to go back and say, um, you have taken this yoke of wood, but this yoke of wood will be turned into a yoke of iron. Jeremiah is telling the truth. Bottom of page 426, the false prophet had strengthened the unbelief of the people, people and Jeremiah and his message, and had wickedly declared himself the Lord's messenger. Okay, now jump down a little bit here, the unrest caused by the representations. This is re really important here. The unrest caused by the representation of the false prophets brought Zedekiah under suspicion of treason. Ah, the very thing that God had advised not to do. Don't let them see you as insurrectionists. Don't let them see you as treasonous. So now the suspicion of treason, treason has been aroused in the mind and thinking of the Babylonians because Nebuchadnezzar has his ear to the ground about what's happening in these various lands that he had set up vassal rulers. It says, uh, and only by quick and decisive action on his part was he permitted to continue reigning as a vassal. Opportunity for such action was taken advantage of shortly after the, re the return of the ambassadors from Jerusalem to the surrounding nations. When the king of Judah accompanied Sariah, the quartermaster, on an important mission to Babylon, this is described in Jeremiah 51, during this visit to the Chaldean court, now watch this, Zedekiah renewed his oath of allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, I think you need to come to Babylon. I need to have a conversation with you. And he gets in there and he gets terrified and he's like, uh, yeah, no, no, an oath, an oath, of course, an oath. We will humbly submit ourselves to you. No insurrection, no rebellion. We are your humble servants. How can we help? How can we pray? God had said to them, hey, you're going to be there for a while. So those of you that were taken away captive, plant your plants, grow your trees, build your houses. You're not going to be there for two years. You're going to settle in for a couple generations. Next paragraph, through Daniel and others of the Hebrew captives, the Babylonian monarch had been made acquainted with the power and supreme authority of the true God. We'll be talking a lot more about that when Elise gets here. When Zedekiah once more solemnly promised to remain loyal, Nebuchadnezzar required him to swear to this promise in the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. Ah, so Nebuchadnezzar's wise here. He doesn't just have him promise or take an oath. He says, take an oath on the name of Yahweh, the honor of the name of Yahweh. You're the people of Yahweh. You're the covenant people of Yahweh. That's your God. So I'm going to make you swear on the name of your God, your covenant-keeping God. Had Hezekiah respected this renewal of the covenant oath, his loyalty would have had a profound influence on the minds of many who were watching the conduct of those who claimed to reverence the name and to cherish the honor of the God of the Hebrews. Now, this is incredible because here again, Ellen White takes this evangelistic angle. The Ellen White's whole angle on, on all of this is Israel in the beginning was always raised up for the very purpose of being God's light to the Gentiles, right? That Israel was always global and inclusive, not regional and exclusive. And so even here, Ellen White's primary concern, right? Like in, in her theology, her primary concern is not, oh, we want you to have an easier time in captivity. We want you to settle in and make it as pleasant as possible. All of that is just for what? For the honor and glory of the name of Yahweh. That's the point. That you will be seen to be honest people, people of integrity, people that keep your word and keep your oath and keep your covenant. So if you say you're going to do something, you do it because your God, Yahweh, is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. That's what I've been told by Daniel and others. This is Nebuchadnezzar speaking. By the way, as we've already mentioned, as, as we will see, God sees a softness in Nebuchadnezzar. Even though he's a monarch of a marauding band of very cruel soldiers, he sees a softness there and an opportunity there, and he doesn't want, frankly, Zedekiah and others to mess up the evangelistic opportunity that he sees with Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, let's read. But Judah's king lost sight of the high privilege of bringing honor to the name of the living God. Of Zedekiah, it is recorded he did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, 
who spoke from the mouth of Yahweh, and he also rebelled against the king Nebuchadnezzar, who made him swear an oath. This is the most important part here. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord God of Israel, 2 Chronicles 36, 12, and 13. So he takes this oath, and then he breaks the oath. While Jeremiah continued to bear his testimony in the land of Judah. Okay, then she talks about Ezekiel here, and I'm not going to spend any time on Ezekiel. Not that it's not important, but I'm just going to, I'm not going to spend any time on that. She basically spends a page and a half talking about how Ezekiel was raised up among the captives, and God took Ezekiel on a little tour and showed him all of the uh, idolatry and, and profanity that was taking place in Judah at the time. Okay, now jump over to, she also uses the word, the men of Judah flattered themselves. So there it is again, that word flattery. Okay, um, jump over to page 429. We're almost at the end here. Um, there's a paragraph that begins, this is a 450, through Jeremiah the Lord. Through Jeremiah the Lord had declared of the wicked men who presumptuously dared to stand before the people in his name. Both prophet and priest are profane. Yes, in my house I have found their wickedness. Jeremiah 23, 11. In the terrible arraignment of Judah, as recorded in the closing narrative of the chronicler of Zedekiah's reign, this charge of violating the sanctity of the temple was repeated. Moreover, the sacred writer declared, now watch this, all the leaders of the priests and the people transgressed more and more according to all the, the abominations of the nations and defiled the house of Yahweh, that is the temple of Solomon, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. So basically, what Ezekiel sees in his tour de force of Israel's profanity and, and idolatry is that the temple of Yahweh was being used for the worship. You know, he sees them weeping over the god Tammuz. So that now that the, the temple has, this is, there's actually a word for this. The technical word for this is called syncretism. You might want to write that down. S-Y-N-C, syncretism, C-R-E-T-I-S-M. Syncretism is an attempted amalgamation of different religions. So when you try to, uh, a, a, a syncretistic or or yeah, a syncretistic religion is a religion where we're trying to bring elements of this religion and elements of this religion together, right? Remember with Judah that they served Yahweh and kept their idols. That's syncreti that syncre It's really hard to say. Syncretism, syncretistic. Where that and that's what's going on here. Here they're in the temple of Yahweh praying and weeping for Tammuz. So this syncretism is totally offensive to God. And this is one of the many reasons that the temple is going to be destroyed because it's just now a building, as we've already described, a kind of quasi-pagan building because it's not being used for the very gospel purpose, the sanctuary gospel purpose that God had established with the tabernacle on the Sinai desert floor. The day of doom for the kingdom of Judah was fast approaching. No longer could the Lord set before the hope of averting the severest judgments. Should he be utterly unpunished, he inquired, you shall not be unpunished. And the word could there, it doesn't say that the Lord would not set before them the hope, just that he could not. And again, we've already talked about how because of the covenantal rules of engagement, God's hands are sometimes constrained by what he can do because he's dealing with free agents that are making choices that are further constraining and narrowing the options that are available to God. So it's not that God, you know, loses his temper and says, that's it, I'm done. It's that the decisions of Judah are so narrowing the, the window in which he can work, the space in which he can work, that now he cannot do things that he formerly could have done. And the thing that he could have done is made their seven years of captivity as nice and as pleasant as possible. But after Zedekiah's rebellion and his oath breaking, that's not going to happen. Okay, so let's now turn the page. Uh, let's see, third to the last paragraph here begins foremost among those. Okay, we're right at the very end here. Foremost among those who were rapidly leading the nation to ruin, Zedekiah was Zedekiah their king. Forsaking utterly the counsels of the Lord as given through the prophets, forgetting the debt of gratitude he owed to Nebuchadnezzar, because Nebuchadnezzar called him in on the carpet and he made a promise. No, 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 it's going to be fine. And Nebuchadnezzar said, swear by Yahweh. And he took an oath by the name of Yahweh. Violating his solemn oath of allegiance taken in the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel, Judah's king rebelled against the prophets, against his benefactor, Nebuchadnezzar, and against his God. In the vanity of his own wisdom, he turned to help for help to the ancient enemy of Israel's prosperity, sending his ambassadors to Egypt that they might give him horses and many people. Okay, well, this is not going to go well. Uh, this, is, this is going to go terribly. He, he thinks like, oh, I got a plan here. I will reach out to 
Egypt, but the problem is, is Egypt begins preliminary negotiations and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not making any arrangements with you. You broke your oath to Nebuchadnezzar. You break your oath to us if given the opportunity because he's not a man of honor. He's not a man of principle. He's not a man of integrity. Let's read that. Will he prosper? The Lord inquired concerning the one who had thus basely betrayed every sacred trust. Will he who does such things escape? Can he break a covenant and still be delivered? As I live, says Yahweh, surely in this place where the king dwells who made him king, whose oath he despised and whose covenant he broke with him in the midst of Babylon, he will die. Nor will Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company do anything in this war since he despised the oath by breaking the covenant. I mean, over and over and over again. Breaking the covenant, breaking the oath. In fact, he gave his hand and still did all that. He gave his hand and still did all the things. He will not escape, Ezekiel 17, 15 to 18. And then the final paragraph, to the profane wicked prince had come the day of final reckoning. Remove the term. So this is not a time for encouragement, okay? Just to use my illustration earlier. This isn't the time to show up and be like, wait, 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 Zedekiah, we have a message of encouragement. No, this is not a time for a message of encouragement. This is a time for a message of sober and serious punishment and chastisement because that is the only thing that might possibly awaken him and alert him to the disastrous circumstance in which he finds himself. To the profane wicked prince had come the day of final reckoning. Remove the turban, the Lord decreed, and take off the crown. Not until, this is incredible, by the way, not until Christ himself should set up his kingdom was Judah again to be permitted to have a king. Overthrown, overthrown, I will make it overthrown was the divine edict concerning the throne of the house of David. It, this is amazing, shall be no longer until he comes whose right it is and I will give it to him. Capital he, capital him, that's Jesus. This is the last king of Judah, which is, of course, the title of the chapter. And did you notice that this chapter opens, let me just remind you how this chapter opens, with what would have been, and it closes with what was. And what would have been, let me read it here, if he had pursued an honorable course, I'm reading, an honorable course toward the Babylonians and paid heed to the messages from the Lord through Jeremiah, he could have kept the respect of many in high authority and could have had the opportunity to communicate, communicate to them a knowledge of the true God. That's what could have been. She continues, the name of God would have been honored far and wide and those that remained in the land of Judah would have been spared the terrible calamity. So the chapter opens with the opportunity and the potential for Zedekiah to what? Behave honorably and to behave in a way that will bring glory and honor and interest in Yahweh. The chapter closes with him breaking his oaths and rebelling against Israel, or rebelling against the people of Judah, rebelling against the prophets, rebelling against the king, and of course, rebelling against God. So, so there's a bookend here. The way the chapter opens and the way the chapter closes are the exact opposite ends of the spectrum. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that is our... That is our chapter today. Let's go to our rubric, the point, the person, the prayer, the practice, and the promise. The point to tell the final chapter of Judah's downfall, of Zedekiah's dishonorable behavior, and of Jeremiah's faithful and honorable prophetic ministry. Jeremiah, in an unflattering way, held the line and told the truth. Was it popular? No. Was it encouraging? No. But was it the truth? Yes. So we have here these sort of two people that we can hold in our hands. We can hold in our hands the dishonorable Zedekiah and the honorable Jeremiah. Okay? And we can see how each of them behave. And you can throw in Hananiah. You know, he was dishonorable, just making stuff up to ingratiate himself to the leadership and to the king. Okay, the person, even in... Here's what I... What do we learn about the person of God here? Even in necessary punishments... God is working behind the scenes to help and to encourage his people. Even in punishment, God's trying to take the edge off, right? Isn't that awesome? Even in punishment, God's trying to take the edge off of the punishment. And then, why is God so concerned about Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar and how they perceive him and his name? Well, here's the answer. God cares for Babylon. God cares for Nebuchadnezzar and his subjects. When God says, 
pray for the peace of the place and work for the good of Babylon. It's not just uh, sort of a utilitarian ethic here, like, hey, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans. You know, like, get along as best as you can to lighten your own load and situation. No, it's because he genuinely wants what's best for the Babylonians, just like he wanted what was best for the Ninevites, just like he wanted what was best for the Egyptians, just like he wants what's best for the world. So, so God here loves the Babylonians and he loves Nebuchadnezzar. Yea, for God so loved the world. So even in necessary punishments, God is working to help and to encourage his people, taking the edge off, and also God cares about Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. That's what we learn about God. And more, but that's what I wrote down. The prayer, here's what I wrote. Father, help me to ignore false and flattering messages and to hear and heed your true words even when they're hard to hear. To hear and heed the truth even when the truth does not tickle your ears and tell you what you want to hear, what you want to be true. God is an encourager, right? But there are times where the message that we need to hear because of serial disobedience or rebellion or whatever is a message of truth about the hole into which we have dug ourselves. And for God to come up and say, hey, you're in a hole right now, and I'm going to do my best to get you out of that hole, but you're in a hole. And then some false flattering person comes up and says, no, you're not in a hole. You're doing great. Don't worry about sin. Don't worry about rebellion. Slay, queen. Slay, king. You're fine. No, be, be a little leery of people that always have something only positive to say to you. Your friends should be like iron sharpening iron, right? What's the proverb there that uh, faithful are the wounds of a friend? And the, 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 the wounds of a friend are better than the kisses, the deceitful kisses of the enemy, right? You want people in your life that will tell you the truth and tell you the truth in such a way that you might not always like what they have to say. That's what a spouse is good for, right? Like it's one of the best things about having an amazing spouse, a godly spouse, is that they'll call you on your BS, right? They'll call you on your stuff. They'll call you on your foolishness. They'll tell you the truth because they're not there just to flatter you. They're there to tell you the truth about a given situation. And you are also there to help them to see another set of eyes, just, just to get it from another perspective. And this is why we need these communities of accountability, families of accountability. That's why we need to be in the word, tuning our ear to truth. So Father, help me to ignore the false and flattering messages that come all around and to hear and to heed your true words even when they're hard. The practice. Well, there's a lot of different ways you could go with this, but I went sort of, you know, just very basic to love the truth, to tell the truth, and to live the truth. In fact, you'd probably say that a little bit differently. I would say, love the truth, live the truth, tell the truth. Love the truth, live the truth, tell the truth. We want to be people that love the truth and that are honest. Our yay is yay and our nay is nay. Our coworkers see us as honest people. They might not always agree with us on everything, but they know that we're not dirtbags. We're not dishonest. We're not just trying to procure uh, some kind of an advantage, whether it's a financial advantage or a professional advantage. We want to be people of integrity. Do we want to be kind? Yes. Do we want, want to be fun? Yes. Do we want to be humorous at times? Yes. Do we want to be fun people to be around? Of course, we want to be all of those things. But we need to be people of integrity, people of truth. That's what God calls us to be, especially in a, in a world where lies are the norm and, and marketing is the norm and deceit is the norm and delusion is the norm. There's an old saying, I forget who said it. It might have even been Martin Luther King Jr. You know, that in a world full of lies, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. It's one of the reasons people don't like Christianity is that Christianity tells at first a very unflattering story about human nature, that human beings don't just need um, a coach or a guru or a, a, a yoga instructor. You don't just need to get more flexible. No, you need to have your sins forgiven. You need to be redeemed. You need to be saved. Your nature is fallen and all of your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Well, you can see how that doesn't go over particularly well with a certain progressive mindset, right? With a kind of 
progressive humanitarian mindset that thinks that human beings are generally good and wonderful and awesome. And it's just the government that gets us down. It's just the capitalist corporations that get us down. We're not the problem. They're the problem. No, the, the Bible tells a rather unflattering story about the nature of human beings. Now, do we bear the image of God? Yes, we do. But that, but that image is fallen and we are self-serving. Our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And we need a savior. And that doesn't land very nicely with some people. But it's the truth. It's the truth. We don't just need a coach or a mentor or a TED Talk. We don't just need to read a book on how to get our act together. We need to be saved, brothers and sisters, by Jesus' blood. We need him to do what only he can do. Amen and amen. Okay, finally here, the promise. I put here that Jesus is the true king of Judah, king of kings and lord of lords. I love the way this chapter ends. You know, that take off the turban, take off the crown, and then the only one that will put that crown on again, the crown of the king of Judah, will be Jesus, who reigns truly and righteously and wonderfully, lovingly, truthfully, mercifully, all of the ways. Jesus is the true king of Judah, and I want to know what your word was. I'm genuinely interested. I'll tell you my word was going to be, I underlined it many, many times, submission. Submission, because I, I like the idea that submission to God. Okay, so there we go, right out of the gate. Reiner says submission. Overturn. Encourage. Submit, says Karen. Jacqueline says doom. Uh, kindness. Submission. Submit. Yeah, a lot of submissions and submit. That's what I thought my word was going to be. Another submission. Who is Laura Mapes, says submission. Flatter, says Cassandra. Submit. Mine was almost submission as well, says Stefan. Well, what was your word, Stefan? Broken, overthrown, flattery, despised. If, says happy blessed mommy. Good word. Submit. Consequence, says either Alice or Reiner. Done. Dichotomy, reckoning, overthrown, says Minka Wiseman. Haven't seen my word yet. Yoke. Oh, great word. Great word, Martha. Defiant, submission, rebellion. Ooh, I'm getting kind of I'm getting kind of giddy here. Nobody's got my word. Why is that? Counsel, fulfilled, quietly, vision, witness. Oh, witness, liberta indeed. Great word. Choices, reckoning, trust, says Rob Roberto. Rebecca says finality. I had overthrown, but changed it, says out to chat. Another yoke, says Nikon Wheeler. A seek, seek, says Arlene. Consistent. Oh, yeah, that's good. Stefan, I didn't see your first word. I just see break. That's your second word. But what was your first word? Sorry, I missed it. Uh, Jerry Beth D says true. Would Nobody's going to have my word. Amazing. Anybody else? Stefan, let me see that first word. I missed it. Hey, I'm Jay. Let's talk, says Flattery. Dashy Dash 707 says could. Okay, Stefan says his word was dichotomy. Okay, good word, good word. T.L. Han says presumptuous. Oh man, this is absolutely wild. Not one person is going to have my word. Wood. Yeah, wood is a good word. You have that whole opening uh, paragraph there. Subjection is your word. No. No, it's not. Wow. I thought I kind of gave it away. I said it over and over and over and over again. Okay. I'm going to give you a couple more seconds here to get it. And if not, I'm going to tell you. Jennifer says plain. Stefan says, is yours counsel? No. I'm going to make a, I think a really persuasive case for my word here. So get, get your book ready. Rebellion, peace, submit, Okay, here it is. Are you ready? Um, my word is honor. My word is honor for several reasons. First of all, the chapter opens, the word honor occurs over and over again in this chapter in different ways. Honored, honor, honorable. 
And there's a lot of behavior in here that is honorable behavior and a lot of behavior that is dishonorable behavior. Okay, so let me just start by reading paragraph one. Okay, by pursuing an honorable course toward the Babylonians and by paying heed to the messages from the Lord through Jeremiah, he could have kept the respect of many in high authority and have had opportunity to communicate to them a knowledge of the true God. Okay, so the word honor means, it can mean many different things, but in this context, it means to behave in accordance with convention or to behave in the right way, to, to do the right thing. And, and even though Judah here is at the very, 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 very end of their rope, there is still a right way to behave, an honorable way to behave, to behave with integrity. And she literally opens with that. Now look at what happens if he behaves honorably. I'm going to stay in that same paragraph. Let me keep reading. The name of God would have been honored far and wide. And those that remained in the land of Judah would have been spared terrible calamities that finally came upon them. So do you see what happens here? If he behaves honorably because he's a follower, it's true with all of us, because we're known to be followers of the one true God, if we behave honorably, well, guess what happens? God's name is honored. Do you see how that works? And then you have this, all of this honorable behavior. So, so when God says, seek the peace of the land, that's behaving honorably. It's behaving rightly to set a good example. Even though you're in captivity, even though your people have been conquered and many have been carried away, you can still behave in an honorable way. Um, they were to make their servitude as pleasant as possible. That is to behave in an honorable way. To seek the peace of the city, that's to behave honorably. To pray for the city, that's to behave honorably. Um, ca carrying on here, it says, from the first, Jeremiah had followed a consistent course in counseling submission to the Babylonians. That's behaving honorably, telling the truth, doing the right thing. Um, against determined opposition, Jeremiah stood firmly for the policy of submission, maintaining an honorable posture, not trying to ingratiate himself to the king, to say the flattering thing. He behaved honorably, rightly, in a dignified way, in an upright way. Um, remember when Jeremiah, when the, when the, when the Han and I came over and broke the yoke and said that he's going to break the yoke of Babylon in just two years? What did Jeremiah do? He just walked away. Right? I'll just read it here. It says, And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. Apparently he could do nothing more than to retire from the scene of conflict. Sometimes walking away from a conflict that has no value or no purpose is the honorable thing to do. So over and over again here, we see Jeremiah behaving honorably. Now watch this. Watch this. Jump over to page 427. Um, the paragraph that begins, Through Daniel and others. Well, watch what happens. Through Daniel and others. Through Daniel and others, the Hebrew captives that of the Hebrew captives, the Babylonian monarch had been made acquainted with the power and supreme authority of the true God. Why? Because they're behaving honorably. Guess what we're going to find out about Daniel? He's going to behave honorably. And that's going to be, that's going to favorably uh, uh, endear him to the king, and it's going to cause him to go up professionally, so to speak. It says, when Zedekiah once more solemnly promised to remain loyal, that was the honorable thing to do. He made an honorable promise. He did the right thing, Zedekiah, in that situation. Nebuchadnezzar required him to swear to this promise in the name of the Lord God of Israel. Why is he making him swear in the name of the Lord God of Israel? Because that's the he knows that that would be the honorable thing for him to do, the right thing for him to do in that situation, because that's his God. Had Zedekiah respected this renewal of his covenant oath, his loyalty would have had a profound influence on the minds of many who were watching the conduct of those who claimed to reverence the name and to cherish the honor of the God of the Hebrews. I mean, she's literally saying it. She, she, she's saying that the whole point for them behaving honorably was so that God's name would be honored. Notice how the next paragraph begins. But Judah's king lost sight of his high privilege of bringing honor to the name of the living God. And then you go over to the very last page, and what happens? How does the whole chapter end? He behaves dishonorably, viol I'm reading, violating his solemn oath of allegiance taken in the name of the Lord God of Israel, Judas king rebelled against the prophets, against his benefactor Nebuchadnezzar, and against his God. He despised his oath and he broke his covenant. It opens with what could have been if he would have, quote, pursued an honorable course. Well, the main outcome of that would have been what? God's name would have been honored. And in the honoring of God's name, the people would have been given more liberties. They would have been treated well. They would have prayed for the peace of Babylon. And you almost get the sense that like Joseph, Right? Which is Daniel's kind of a Joseph figure. 
Daniel's like a Joseph figure in the court of Babylon, but what if all of these people, even though they're captive, what if they told Nebuchadnezzar and others the story, hey, look, the reason that God is using you as his instrument is because we have generationally rebelled. And, and you get the strong sense here that God was doing his best to, even at this late, late hour, urge and encourage his people to behave honorably so that to behave correctly, to behave rightly, to behave uprightly and, and virtuously and honorably so that the name of Yahweh would be regarded with honor. And so uh, go back and have a look at it and see what you think. I mean, she uses the word like six or seven times, and uh, I, I thought it was really persuasive. I think it's good. Uh, by the way, lots of other great words there too, but um, I, I, the reason I felt like I really had to make my case tonight was because nobody had my word. So I'm like, whoa, I, am I the only person that saw this? So I want to encourage you, if you have the time between now and tomorrow, Go back and just reread that chapter through and circle all the times that honored, honorable, or honor occurs. And I think you'll be amazed that it's really one of the major motifs of the chapter. And I guess the takeaway lesson for us is, God, help us in our spheres of influence, in our families, in our work, in our situations, to behave in ways that are honorable. I know we don't hear a lot about honor anymore because honor is old-fashioned and honor is, you know, passe. It's obsolete, but we should be people that still believe in honor, living honorable lives and behaving in honorable ways by which we just mean the right way. And what is the right way? The way that God urges us and asks us and invites us to live. And when we do that, hallelujah, we bring honor, which means respect, glory, fame to the name of God. So I hope you all enjoyed that. That was a great lesson. We will be back tomorrow for lessons 37 and 38. Let me just double check to make sure that's right. Tomorrow we have a double chapter. Yes, carried captive into Babylon, 37, and light through the darkness, 38. And then that will finish section four. And then the next day, Elise will be with us to begin Daniel, the book of Daniel, which is going to be great. All right, everybody, just over an hour, about an hour and looks like eight minutes. So let me pray with you. Father in heaven, thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your goodness. Help us to be people that live lives of truth, lives of honor, lives of integrity. And Father, that's not something we can do ourselves. It's not something we can internally generate. Lord, we need that to come to us by your spirit and by the blood of Jesus. Father, we want in our spheres of influence, our various spheres of influence, to be people that are known as disciples of Jesus, followers of the one true God. And even if people don't believe in our God, they don't love our God, they don't serve our God, may they say of us that those people are sincere, those people are kind, those people are helpful, those people believe what they live and they live what they believe. Father, this is not something, again, we can generate or do on our own. We need you by your spirit to do this in us and through us, transform us, make us into honorable people, vessels of honor, as scripture says. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.